Have you ever wondered what it's like with your succulents in the ground? Because it turns out, it's not that hard. Killer? Was it all my fault? There is a way to save them all. Burn. You must rise up. Seek the knowledge that you need. Their fate is in your hands. Hello everyone, my name is Chuck, presenting for Series Capades, and in this video we're going to do something a bit different from my usual videos. This is actually a presentation that I prepared for a live stream a few weeks ago on Jello Sanctuary on Facebook. And as you can tell from the intro just now, this is about having your succulents out in the ground in a more tropical setting. To give you more context on this video, this is supposed to be aimed at the Philippines. So it is in the Philippine context. The Philippines is located at the tropics and it is just above the equator. So you could imagine that it is fairly warm throughout the year. So if you live somewhere that is somewhat tropical, then this video might be for you. Now I am preparing this as a standalone video because we have had issues with getting a backup or a copy of the original live stream to go. And at the same time, the live stream was in mixed language, English and Filipino, and it would be too much work just adding subtitles. So, you know, I think this is easier. So without further ado, let's start. So this is the presentation titled Planting in the Ground, presentation by Series Capades, and let us begin. So as I've noted here, this is going to be a long presentation, so make sure you are settled, grab a drink or food, and get ready. This will take a while. So, you want to plant succulents in the ground. Now, this photo was taken a few years ago. This is a ground arrangement that I made. And as you can see in the middle, this is an Echeveria Mauna Loa, surrounded by a clump of a sea of Echeveria elegans and a line of Senecio serpents and these are Echeveria imbricata, a bunch of freelies at the back, some Agavoides hybrids and whatnot. So I've got a whole lot of plants in the ground. And if you wanted to do something similar then keep watching. Right, you wanted to plant in the ground but you are afraid that they'll die exposed to the rain. Fair enough. So. In this presentation, I am going to stress this a lot, that everything's connected. So we have all of the variables, all of the factors involved in keeping a plant happy. And we are going to discuss this, all of these things, one by one. And this is what I've noticed with a lot of people in succulent groups. They tend to ask about specific things. They are very concerned about a specific aspect, and I could not blame them for that. This is mainly because when you are starting out, you do not know a whole lot of things. So you tend to dwell on the things that you know or you have just learned. And, you know, master one thing at a time, expand your knowledge until you finally have a breadth of knowledge or a better understanding of how everything works. And 
hopefully this presentation is going to give you jumpstart that knowledge give you the breath that you need all right so as i have mentioned we have to take a holistic approach rather than just focus on one thing and here's a good analogy i'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the fire triangle you need three things to start a fire of course there's oxygen there's heat and fuel without any of those you would not be able to start a fire i think it's more or less the same way with succulents if you just dwell on one specific part and forget about one part or one component then it will not work another analogy that i like using is the exposure triangle so for those of you photographers in the crowd this would be very familiar this would be very intuitive basically what this means is that if you adjust one of these variables you would need to adjust the rest to compensate at least that's if you want to keep the same type of exposure for instance if you increase the shutter speed it will make things darker so you would need to adjust either the iso or aperture to make things to make the scene bright again now if you are not familiar with photography then maybe we could use other analogies another analogy for the math nerds this time we have a bunch of formula and basically we have variables and adjusting one of the variables and if you want to keep the equation the same then that means that you would also have to adjust the rest of the, var the variables to keep the value or to keep the result the same now this might intimidate you so let's go with something more simple so here's hopefully something a lot simpler we have an equation x plus y equals to 100 so if you define x to be 10 then that means that y would be 90 that would make them 100 so again variables are just one thing you would have to adjust the other thing to compensate all right as i mentioned in the past few slides you have to think of the whole thing as an equation it is not just one variable one variable would affect the entire equation and you would have to compensate elsewhere so here's a rough way of putting it we have the plants needs on one side and on the other side we have a bunch of things that we provide to the plant now let's look at that in the context of the tropics so in the tropics things tend to be more warm on average throughout the year and there's more rainfall annually compared to areas further away from the equator now to be frank here in melbourne in australia or in other parts away from the equator we do get very hot days sometimes it goes all the way up to 50 hence us having bushfires but the thing is we also have winter the other extreme where the temperature goes really low so if you take an average of the entire year's temperature then it would come out lower than that in the tropics in the tropics it tends to be you know more on the average side so maybe throughout the year it's in the high 20s low 30s celsius and yeah just look at it on average all right given the same equation from the previous slide in order to fix this we would need to compensate for the increased temperature by filtering the light and with water by improving the drainage and by doing those improvements those adjustments you finally meet you get to meet the plant's needs again and everything is balanced as they should be i could not stress this enough newbies they tend to ask for very specific information specific numbers and they tend to try to copy the whole thing to the letter and i have a problem with that mainly because they do not necessarily have the same conditions in their garden the same growing conditions the same amount of light the same amount of rainfall the same amount of the same types of plants the same soil composition you know there's a lot of things that could be different a lot of variables to consider so simply copying what someone else is doing is not really a good idea so if you want to blindly copy someone's advice then you would need to copy the entire thing and not just the specific thing that you're asking for so again the key here is to identify the type of adjustments that you need to do and act on them so what is the key pm <laughs> yeah lousy joke pm is the key anyway the meat of this video could be summed up by this statement you have to think about everything as a whole and you have to understand that this might not be intuitive maybe doing something would not affect the whole thing 
the way you think it would do. So that is enough of the intro. Let's have a look at the variables. So here we go. These are the three main things that you have to consider. There are many variables under that, but I would like to group them into these three main groups. So we have light, water, and plant. So under light, we have all of these things. We have quantity, quality, modifiers. We have temperature, farina in terms of light, top dressing. There's an aspect to it that affects light. Then we, on water, we have drainage, water retention, top dressing, again farina in terms of repelling water. We have the source of water, water quantity. Then finally, under the plant group of variables, we have the native habitat, growing habit, growing period, growing medium, health, and nutrition. Now, you do not have to worry about this for now. I am going to go through them one by one later in this presentation. So as you can see, I have listed a lot of things in here. They, there might be something that I am missing out on, but you know, this... These are the things that came to my mind immediately. So I guess these are the more important ones. Anything else might not be as important. Exactly. <laughs> so under the light group of variables, these are the things that you have to consider. Let me just go through them quickly. Light quantity is basically the amount of light in a given period of time. Quality, how much of the light that you provide can be used in photosynthesis. Light modifiers is basically how you affect the light without changing the light source. Temperature mainly relates to plant activity and dormancy. And on either extreme end, this can cause damage to the plants. Farina, of course, a lot of you already know this. This serves as a plant's sunscreen because it reflects UV light. Top dressing in the context of light is basically reducing heat transmission and it, it could also reflect much needed light to lower leaves. Now from the water group of variables, we have drainage, water retention, top dressing, again farina, water source, and quantity. Drainage means a measure of how likely flooding can happen. So the, the more poor the drainage, the more likely it is to flood. Water retention, I have separated this from drainage because this is more of how much water is being retained in the medium. So drainage is how water flows through and retention is basically the inverse where we are dealing with the porosity of your medium. Top dressing. In terms of water, this reduces soil evaporation rate because top dressing is basically mulch and it provides mulching effect. Farina in the context of water is basically water repulsion. So the epic uticular wax that is coating the leaves and the stems of the plant, this is hydrophobic and it repels water. And it also prevents the plant from losing some of these stored water. Water source, basically we are talking about where the water is coming from. This could be natural precipitation or manual watering. Quantity, basically the amount of water that you provide within a given period of time. Finally, the plant group of variables are the native habitat, growing habit, the growing period, growing medium that they need, the health and nutrition. So these are all of the variables and the big question is how do you plan to address these? Now don't worry about missing out on the explanation from the previous slides because I'll be discussing this one by one. The previous slides were just meant to be more of a quick run through, through all the variables. So again, the question was, how do you plan to address these? And the first thing that you have to do is to identify the variables that you can't easily change. An example would be climate and temperature. Yes, climate change is a thing, but it is not something that we could easily change. Temperature, it might take a bit of effort, you know, if you create a, a greenhouse, a hot house, or maybe do some air conditioning it is resource intensive so i don't think it is something easy to do either although i did mention here that you could create various microclimates within your area by you know doing some adjustments and i'll be discussing those later in this presentation another thing that we can't easily change depending on where you live is plant availability so in a way you are limited by the types of plants that you could purchase and that is especially hampered now by the pandemic and the lockdowns so you know the selection might be a bit limited for now, or at least the acquisition part 
becomes more difficult with a lot of plants dying in transit. All right, so here is a good example. Uh, Aeoniums, they thrive in the range of 4 to 38 degrees Celsius, and they actively grow at around 10 to 25. Outside of that tiny range, you could expect some sort of slowdown happening, especially at the higher end of the spectrum. So when it is warm, they are definitely shut down. When it gets too cold, they also shut down, but they tend to like lower temperature ranges. Now to place better context on why that is, you have to consider where Aeoniums are endemic to. They are found in the Canary Islands. It is a bunch of islands off of the coast of Morocco and I have encircled that here in the red one. They have a climate called the Mediterranean climate and it is so cold because it is found along the along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. And this map shows where else in the world you could find this type of climate. So the Mediterranean climate is CSA or CSB or CSC. The main thing that you have to know are the first two letters, the C and S. Now in case you were wondering, this map is a climate classification map developed by Köppen and Geiger. So this is called the Köppen Geiger climate classification map. And in this map, we are showing you the CS, the, the CS areas. So we have a bunch of these on the west coast of the Americas, all along the Mediterranean, some, some parts inland in Asia, Africa, and parts in, and some parts of the coast of Australia. So in Melbourne, where I live, we have a climate classification of CFB, which is temperate cool summer. I'll be explaining what that means later on in this presentation. I have encircled in the map where Melbourne can be found. So we are basically at the southern near the southern tip of the mainland. Geography wise, we are close to CS climate. And you can see that in the map here, we are just right next or surrounded by CS types of climates. So here's a snapshot of the Copen climate type of Victoria. Victoria is the state of Australia where I am from. This circle here is where Melbourne is, this tiny area here. And Victoria is very vast, as you can see in the map. So Melbourne has a CF climate and the further that you go inland, it turns into a CS. I think the easiest way to describe this is we have more precipitation compared to CS. Now we go to the Philippines. Again, this presentation was about the Philippine climate and this is the Copen map for the Philippine climate. As you can see, most of the Philippines is under a tropical climate. So we have AF, AM and AW. There are some areas very tiny areas where you could see a bunch of greens and those areas are CF and CW. So as you recall in the previous slide, my climate is based on CF while Philippines has patches of CF. So basically what that means is that if you live in any of those areas with green patches, then you would be able to do almost exactly the same you know, as I do. It would be a lot easier for you to copy the things that I do in my garden. All right. So as you can see, I've encircled all of the areas containing the green patches. And if you look closely, you would find a hidden Mickey. <laughs> no, seriously, uh, there are lots of patches throughout the Philippines, tiny patches. And if you look into those patches, they are mainly highlands or mountainous areas, high elevation areas. And the climate up there is way different from the lowlands where most of the Philippines is. So as mentioned, most of those in the sea type of climate are in high elevation areas. And those specifically in CFB, such as this patch and a bunch of stuff here, they would be able to do exactly or almost the same that I am doing here with the relative ease. Now, as for everyone else in the blue areas, you would need to do a lot of adjustments. So if you try to understand the differences between the climate classifications, this would give you a better idea of what you would need to do to make it more habitable for your plants. So in this slide, I am showing you the Köppen Geiger climate types of the United States. As you can see, on the west coast is a lot of CS. On the bottom right quadrant, you would see a lot of CF. In the center would be a lot of B. On the top right quadrant, it is mostly D. And I think there's even a tiny patch of E's somewhere, I think in Alaska. The island states are mostly tropical with A. I have encircled Southern California here in blue because as you know, there's a lot of rockeries, a lot of succulent gardens in the ground. 
and that's where Laura Eubanks is and yeah a lot of impressive succulent gardens out there and it is a lot easier for them because their climate is almost perfect for it another area that I would like to point out is the climate map of Mexico because as you know a lot of cacti and succulents are endemic to this area so I think a lot of them are in this area where we have B and we have climates B and C I think the Echeveria are more in C and a lot of the cacti are in maybe B and these days the rage are a lot of the succulents coming out from Korea from South Korea and in case you were wondering what type of climate they have they mostly have a C CW or CF all around the coast and that's where I imagine the nurseries would be coming from so far I've been throwing around climate A and climate C but what do they mean exactly so group A is what we call tropical climates and this is identified by the first letter so the first letter so the first letter basically means tropical and the second letter denotes the precipitation on certain parts of the year so F means rainforest and this basically means that the rainfall is distributed every month you would get a high amount of rainfall with monsoons there's a bit of differentiation between winter and summer so at one period you would see increased rainfall and the other period is less rainfall so instead of a uniform amount of rainfall throughout the year you have a wet and a dry season WNS are similar to monsoon only it's more more drastic more extreme and the letters W or S basically refers to the season where it is dry so W means dry winter and S means dry summer all right this is the more detailed explanation you do not have to dwell on them too much but basically af means that the average precipitation is over 60 millimeters every month the average temperature is 18 degrees or higher this part the 18 degrees or higher is common to all of the a climates group a and the second letter as i have mentioned earlier denotes the precipitation so af constantly raining am it has a dry period and aw or as is like am but the wet and dry seasons are more defined and as for group c or the temperate climates we have again the first letter c meaning temperate and the second letter as mentioned earlier denotes the precipitation so w and s again dry winter for w s dry summer f means there's no dry season the precipitation is distributed throughout the seasons well, the third letter is basically the temperature range. We have A, B, and C. A is the hottest, C is the coldest, B is somewhere in between or the Goldilocks zone. So if you wanted more details on each, I'm going to show this for a few seconds so you can pause if you want to read. But basically, if we break it down, we have the first letter as C. All of them are in group C, meaning temperate climate. The second letter denotes the average rainfall. So with F, it is more or less distributed throughout the seasons w and s means that it is dry at certain times of year w means it is dry in winter s means it is dry in summer the third letter is basically the average temperature range a being the hottest c being the coolest and b being somewhere in between so we have a combination of all of those to create all of these climate types and as for seasons if you follow the meteorological reckoning or the meteorological system we have we are following the calendar months and this makes it a lot easier for research and reporting purposes because you have a fixed um, fixed number of months fixed number of days every year and it makes things a lot easier to compare year on year because you are always comparing from let's say winter is december to february in the northern hemisphere so you're always comparing within those date ranges for those further away from the equator this is probably very intuitive you already know this so in the northern hemisphere we have winter during december to february march to may to, for spring june to august for summer september to november for autumn it is reversed in the southern hemisphere so when you are having your winter we are having our summer right now we have our winter which means it is summer for those in the northern hemisphere so yeah just a bit of background information in case you didn't know this the other major system used for defining the seasons is the astronomical reckoning this is based on solstices and equinoxes and as you know these dates change every year we just had the last solstice a few well several weeks ago and in our case we are now 
starting to have longer days. And for those of you in the Northern Hemisphere, your days are starting to get shorter now. So we have the December to March equinox, the March to June solstice, June to September equinox, September to December solstice. So taking all of what we have discussed in the previous slides, the differences between group A and group C is av higher average precipitation in group A and higher average temperature in group A compared to group C. So from that alone, I think you already have a pretty good idea of what you would need to do to make your climate closer to that of the group C climate. Basically, you just have to overcome these two things, the higher temperature and higher precipitation. So just a bit of background information on the Köppen-Geiger map. So Vladimir Köppen was a botanist and the climates group that were defined are based on what type of vegetation grows in a given area. This was further refined by Rudolf Geiger, so the classification is called the Köppen-Geiger classification. The reason I included this slide in this presentation is because I wanted to point out that this is very good for us plant enthusiasts because the whole thing is already based on plants or at least where they are able to grow it makes it a lot easier for us although there are a few caveats to the Köppen Geiger map and this has been addressed by the Truartha climate classification basically in a lot of uh, large land masses the inland areas in the Köppen map they are just mainly large swaths of let's say like Victoria earlier, it's just a lot of green. There's no new ones between smaller areas. With Truartha, it is more granular and more defined. You know, it's more micro in scale. But I would not be going through that because there's not a lot of resources online showing the different Truartha class climate classifications. The Copen one is a lot more established, and there are more maps that you could find that you could find online. So I'm just going to stick with that. If you want to go further on this, then you could go look up Truartha for your area. But for the purposes of this presentation, I'm just going with the Copen maps. In the Philippines, we have this group called the, the Succulent Club Philippines, and they have published recommendations on what on how to care for your succulents. They have gone through a lot of details, a lot of information, and I would highly recommend that you at least have a read through it. I'll provide the link in the description but basically the recommendations provided by tscp is based on the metro manila climate and for those of you who are not familiar with the philippine geography metro manila is somewhere in this area if you could see my mouse pointer and as you can see the climate here is you know this light blue and medium blue and according to the legend on this side, it is tropical savanna or tropical monsoon, AW or AM. So everywhere that is in AW or AM, you could simply just copy the recommendations that they have set or the, the guides that they have provided. Otherwise, if you are out, let's say out in AF, then you would need to do something different. You would need to do a lot more adjustments compared to those who are living in AW or AM. So a recap on the climate, a means tropical, the second letter means amount of precipitation. And in AF, the precipitation is more or less constant throughout the year. So if you live in any of those areas, you would know that it is always, almost always raining every month. And you have to contend with precipitation more than the rest of the country. So we have the variables here again, and that was a very long segue on climate just to prove a point. And now we are going to start with the light group of variables right for, from here on out I'm going to hide my webcam so the first item under the light variables is the light quantity it basically refers to the amount of light that you provide over a period of time this mainly depends on your source of light and the length of exposure it is currently winter here in Melbourne and I'm getting a reading of 110,000 lux in summer, the sun is higher up in the sky and it is a bit closer compared to winter. So it should go up to approximately 120 to 130 lux. This photo was taken in winter and it is facing due north. And this was taken at around sometime between 12 to 1 p.m. Due to the tilt of the earth, the sun appears to be low on the horizon during winter. And on more extreme latitudes, it would be a lot lower. And thus the light intensity would also be lower because there's a lot more distance for the light from the sun to travel. So something that I've discussed in previous episodes or in previous videos is 
the concept of indicator plants. The idea here is to create a map of usable areas in your garden. So the way to do this is that you have to choose a plant that you have a lot of or something that you can grow very easily or something that you are very familiar with. Ideally one that propagates easily so you could have a lot of them rather quickly. And of course they might they must be something that you would you wouldn't mind using in experiments because they might die as a result of your experimentation. So the second step is to plant them at various spots in the garden and see how they go throughout the seasons. Knowing how they do in certain parts of the garden will give you a better idea of what you would need to do you know, if you plan to plant there. Let's say you have three groups of plants or three areas that you've chosen to experiment with. Let's call them plant A, plant B, and plant C. Plant A seems to be doing all right it maintains its uh, nice compact rosette form it doesn't seem to be stretching it doesn't seem to be getting pale so you could say that the area where plant a is is ideal for that plant now let's say plant b seems to be stretching that tells me that the area where plant b is is not receiving enough sunlight or not receiving enough light that the plant is starting to stretch or teolate and you would need to give that plant more light. As an indicator plant, this tells me that the area where plant B is is not receiving enough light. You should either find ways to reduce the amount of shade that it receives or use plants that are more shade tolerant compared to your indicator plant. Now let's say plant B is all closed up looking very dry. It might mean that it is getting too much sunlight, too harsh, it is drying up too much. You might have to increase water retention or maybe you would need to do some shade. I don't know. It depends on how the plant is actually looking like. So if you look at that plant, you would get a good idea of what you would need to do to adjust. And the only thing that you have to know here is to be able to identify you know, what sort of behavior these plants have. You would need to know how they would react to extreme heat, to extreme dehydration or to lack of light you know how they react to extremes and that would give you a better idea of how to adjust accordingly i did make some videos on the topic before they are part of episode 98 and 160 they are not standalone so you might have to wade through some of the content for that but yeah i might have to create a standalone video on this at some point light quality this refers to how much of that light is usable for photosynthesis. There is this thing called PAR, P-A-R, or photosynthetically active radiation. So there are there is a part of the light spectrum that is conducive to growth. Everything else, not so much. This is mainly relevant for grow lights because you know we have full spectrum lights and lights that are only provide specific spectrums. You would see a lot of red, blue, purple stuff like that generally you would want to have full spectrum but the problem with that is you would probably need a lot more power from full spectrum light so yeah i am not an expert on grow lights but i am learning so i would leave that for others who are more knowledgeable than me on grow lights to discuss you could probably just search for grow lights related content here on youtube so light modifiers are the things that we add or remove to adjust the intensity of the available light. And this is by adding more shade or filtering the light or removing the shade to add more light. Basically anything else that you do to adjust that is not related to changing your light source. This is an old photo back in one of the summers. I think this was the summer of 2018 or 2017. I am not sure anymore. More likely 2018. And this is something that I do every year. I lay down some stakes, metal stakes, and attach shade cloth to shield the plants from extreme heat. But I got tired of doing that every year. So last summer, I built a freestanding pergola so that I could simply just attach the shade cloth on top of them. And this saves me a lot of time mounting the shade cloth because I have some hooks and I just hook on the cloth onto the frame and of course outside of summer i remove the shade cloth that way the plants would be getting more light temperature this usually goes hand in hand with light intensity but also largely to do with climate so in the tropics it is more humid which is why it is constantly warm because a lot of the heat is being trapped by the atmosphere by the humid atmosphere here's the temperature range of the philippines on average the coldest month 
is at 22.3 to 29.5 degrees Celsius on average. The warmest month is 25.7 to 33.4 Celsius on average. Again, these are averages. There are outliers on either end. It could be lower than that. It could be higher than that. So the hottest month in the Philippines is May. It is the last month of spring. You might be wondering why not summer? This is mainly because if you recall the Philippines climate, it is AW or AM. AW means that it is dry in winter and it is wet in summer. In summer, there's a lot of rain and the thing about um, moisture, about humidity is that it tends to equalize the temperature. So if it is more extreme in higher temperature range, when it rains, it tends to get a bit cooler. While during winter, when it is really cold, when it starts raining, the temperature rises higher by a few degrees. So that's what I mean by equalizing. So the coldest month in the Philippines is in January. It is a uh, it is a warm winter with the average range of 22.3 to 29.5. It is not cold by any means as experienced by those in temperate climates, but it is their winter nonetheless. You know, Their winters are so mild that the deviation from summer is not that far anyway, it, which is why in the Philippines, we just tend to classify it as the wet and the dry season. Sure, they feel the heat and the cold parts of year, but the wet and the dry parts are more obvious. Farina. Now, in the context of light, Farina is serving as some sort of sunscreen. It blocks UV rays from penetrating the plant. And this barrier prevents damage from happening on the leaves. Now, with succulents, Farina, once rubbed off, do not regenerate on the leaves. You would need to wait for new leaves with enough Farina to grow in order to be able to protect itself from light. In succulents, if you give them enough light, the new leaves will be growing with thicker Farina than the previous leaves. Trying to maintain or build up Farina is essentially the reason why we encourage people to acclimatize their plants. Basically, you're gradually increasing the amount of light that you're giving the plant in stages. You're giving them enough time to push out new leaves with enough farina. That way, if you step up the amount of light again, those new leaves would protect the rest of the plant and in turn, it would produce even more leaves with even thicker farina. So the gradual part or the time element here is just to give them enough time for the leaves to grow out and to replace the older leaves. Top dressing. Now, in the context of light, top dressing is another barrier preventing UV from reaching the soil. As a result, with no UV rays hitting the soil, the soil would not heat up, thus protecting the roots from heat and keeping them relatively cool. In addition to the UV protection barrier, light colored pebbles could also potentially reflect much needed light back to the plant. So more details here. So for top dressing, as mentioned earlier, light colored pebbles reflect light and further reducing the heat conductivity. Pebbles are poor conductors of heat, especially since a microscopic part or just a tiny part of the rock or, or the pebble itself is touching other pebbles. So heat conductivity is mostly via the air gaps in between and thus it is very poor. This is even more so when you're using porous rocks because there's even more air gaps thus further slowing down or reducing the rate of conductivity. As also mentioned earlier, reflected light will provide much needed sunlight for the lower leaves. And the thing about the reflected light is that it is much weaker than direct sunlight. And I have to specifically call this out because there's a lot of people who are against top dressing citing this as a reason why, saying that the light reflected by the top dressing would burn the plant. Well, here's what I have to say to you. If it ever comes to the point that the reflected light is enough to burn the plants, what more the direct sunlight? If you even let it go that far, it is entirely your fault. You should have removed the plant or shaded it or filtered the light because the plant would be burnt by the direct sunlight or direct light long before the reflected light would be even enough or even strong enough to burn the undersides of the leaves. So those claims are completely wrong. Another thing about top dressing is that maybe for the darker ones, they have potentially higher absorption of heat absorption rate than lighter pebbles since, you know, absorption versus reflection. And this might be useful in colder climates, but you know, again, they are very poor conductors. So relying, relying on them to provide or to conduct heat is not really, uh, it's not really efficient. 
So in summary, for the light section, to adjust for light and heat, you have to check the length of day or the amount of exposure to the sun that you're giving them. Secondly, you have to gradually increase the sun exposure rather than just placing them in under the sun right away. They will burn that way. For very intense sunlight or UV, you might have to filter using shade cloth or UV resistant materials. Or failing that, you could use other taller plants or features to cast shadows on the other plants. So this would be design based. Another thing you could do is to use pebbles as mulch or top dressing. This would decrease heat conductivity through the soil and reduce the amount of light wasted by reflecting them back into the plant. You should also encourage the farina growth on your plant and this is done by doing gradual sun exposure. And when you are designing your garden, do it during the hottest time of year. The reason I say that is because you would be able to find out the hot spots or the dark spots in your garden, in your layout, and you would know how to further adjust these areas to make it more habitable for your plants. If you do this during the off seasons or rather the seasons where it is not too hot, then you would be in for a surprise once you get into summer. So it's best to do it while it is hot. That way you would have first-hand experience seeing how the plants are doing under intense heat. So the next group of variables are water-related variables. And under that, we have drainage, water retention, top dressing, farina in terms of water repulsion, water source, and quantity. So the following three items are closely related, and these are drainage, water retention, and top dressing. So in order to adjust for those, the first one of the things that you should consider is elevating the garden bed. So by elevating your garden bed, you are taking advantage of gravity-assisted drainage. Even poor soil will retain less water when used in a raised bed. The next tip here is to use slopes because by using slopes, you are able to direct the flow of water on the surface of the soil. Anything that is not absorbed by the soil would just run off and erode over the slope. So this is best done in conjunction with elevation. If you do not have the materials to elevate to create a raised bed, another option is to dig down and to cultivate the existing soil. But the key here is that you are loosening up the existing soil and you might need to mix it with some aggregates to make it as loose as your soil mix that you intend to use in the area. The important part here is that you have to make sure that the soil is homogeneous. And like the earlier tip with elevation and slopes, you could also dig slopes. That way, water has somewhere to flow when it gets flooded. And this is something that you could do to verify that your slopes are working properly. So once you have dug down, make sure to do a flood test. This is basically just flooding the area, hosing down, and making sure that the excess water are flowing outwards or away instead of creating pools, as you can see in this photo. So if something like this happens, then you would probably need to create channels or slopes just to make sure that there is proper drainage or flow or an outlet for the water to go to. So the next variable is water retention. And unlike in pots, in ground, water flows down and laterally. So they flow in various directions, not just straight down. This is as opposed to pots where water tends to just flow down from the draining holes at the bottom, especially if your pot is sealed or glazed or made of plastic. This is somewhat mitigated by porous pots or pots that allow moisture to seep through the walls. But even so, those types of pots still retain more water than if you have them in the ground. So what does that mean for us? Well, it means that in the ground, you can be a bit more liberal with your mix because the water retention is better than in pots anyway. And by being more liberal with your mix, reducing the amount of aggregates or inorganic material, that means that you might be able to save a bit more, especially if uh, rocks or pebbles are quite expensive in your area. But of course, keeping the soil mix loose is better because you give them a lot more surface area for drying. And the plants, the succulents, they need the moisture from the air gaps itself not necessarily directly from the water. So having lots of air gaps means that when you water the area, those air gaps would be moist after they flood, after they drain out. So the moist air being trapped in those air gaps are perfect. That's what succulent plants really want. So preparing loose soil at a larger scale, as I mentioned earlier, you can be more liberal with your mix. It may or may not need the same ratio. So if you're usually doing a one is to one ratio, one part of regular soil 
one part of inorganic material. Maybe you could dilute that by going two is to one, maybe two parts of regular soil and one part of your aggregate. Because in the setting of the ground, they would not retain too much anyway. Again, it depends a lot on your climate and other variables, so you would have to play it by the ear on your own. But when preparing your loose soil, the important thing to note here is that to make sure that the soil mix is homogeneous. Do not use different layers of different types of porosity. I know that in the past we were being taught to use different layers in your garden bed or in your pots, but modern studies have shown that that is a bad idea. It's due to something called soil mechanics. So the way it works is that water would first have to oversaturate a layer before it permeates and flows down into the next layer. I think the easiest way to imagine that is to look at a sponge. Now, if you drench the sponge and place it on top of rocks, the sponge has to completely oversaturate first before any of the water trickles down onto the rocks. So it doesn't matter that the layer below the sponge is very loose, just large rocks or large pebbles. The sponge has to oversaturate first before any water could flow through. That's the same thing with soil. So now imagine that this is your soil layer and these are the roots of the plant. If your layer is only this thick, then as the soil layer saturates, the roots are constantly in contact with the water and that's going to be a problem. But if your soil layer becomes deeper, something like this, then as that layer saturates, the water will be focused on the lower part of this layer and that would be away from the roots. That's the setup that we're going for. So just make sure that your soil mix is homogeneous and thick enough so that what any water that pulls would be far away from the plant's roots. I personally like using red scoria and red scoria is very plentiful here in Victoria and Melbourne. The reason why I like red scoria is because it's so easy. They contrast against the dark soil and it is easy to see if I have mixed it properly because all I have to do is look for large clumps of black and eliminate them. So whichever style you end up doing, just make sure that the layers are thick. So as you can see in this photo, I have an elevation here and the rest I dug down. You could do a combination of them that is mainly entirely up to your design. Another test that you could do is something that I call the wet clump test. So basically you have to drench your soil mix and grab a clump of them and squeeze them in your palm then open up your palm. If the clump crumbles then you're good otherwise if it stays as a single clump then you would need to further loosen it. So the next aspect to water retention is top dressing so it serves as barrier between leaves and the soil. This is important because any splashback from maybe hosing or rains it can potentially bring back microbes from the soil onto the leaves and it could lead to infections, especially if there are open wounds or damage on the leaves. Having top dressing also mitigates the effects of erosion because not only do you get rid of some of the nutrients but also it creates a deposit on wherever they flow into and that deposit is going to be clumpy depending on the type of soil or type of material that you have. Now for those who are using very light aggregates like perlite or maybe even some pumice, Having top dressing prevents floaters from rising. Having floaters is bad because what happens is your soil layer now becomes differentiated. The lighter or the looser materials are at up top and the bottom would just be soil. And we end up at the same problem again where you have differentiation in layers and that's not what we want. And additionally, top dressing does not compact unlike regular soil because they are loosely held and that's what we want. They can also serve as mulch preventing weeds from growing so if you do not cover the soil potentially you would potentially see a lot of weeds. And of course by definition as mulch it reduces the rate of evaporation allowing the soil to retain more, mo more moisture. Now a lot of you are worried about this aspect. This is the reason a lot of you state why you do not like using top dressing. But the thing is, it is not the fault of the top dressing itself. It is more of a combination of top dressing and the ability of your soil mix to drain properly. Now, even if you didn't have top dressing, but if your soil mix doesn't drain, then you would be having the same problem anyway. So personally, what I prefer doing is to have a very well draining mix and put top dressing on top because of all of the other benefits that I mentioned earlier. Now, depending on the type of material that you use for your top dressing, porous rocks can hold excess water and they slowly release it as the soil becomes more dry. Having lots of rocks tends to deter snails and slugs. They prefer not to crawl on top of them. And of course, in terms of landscapes, having top dressing means that 
there are places that you can step on or to work in and that makes it easier to get to hard to reach areas because if you just have the entire area filled with plants or a tapestry then it would be very hard to move around since i i assume you wouldn't want to step on your plants so here in melbourne it is very rainy during winter and in summer i took this photo sometime last month during a string of rainy days i think it was raining for three to four days straight and as you can see the area behind the divider is not flooded but the area outside the divider is flooded and the reason for that is because the soil waste that i use for my tapestry is draining properly while this ones i haven't replaced at all you can clearly see the pooling of water that's happening outside while inside the plants are doing fine so here's another photo showing the pooling of water outside the barrier outside the divider and inside everything's fine it's much less of a problem here because the water would be draining down and away from the plants. So water source. What we're really talking about here is whether you are irrigating your plants or relying on precipitation. And the thing about precipitation is that it is usually accompanied by a temperature shift. I think I mentioned this earlier that during hot summer days when it starts raining, the temperatures go down a bit. While in the inverse, on very cold, on cold days in winter, when it starts raining, temperatures tend to rise a bit. So I think it's an, an equalizer. It tends to bring, bring the temperatures to the normal, closer to the midpoint. So water quantity, this is the amount of moisture provided to the plant over a period of time. So this is based on the amount of water that you actually provide versus the amount of water that is actually retained and how much the plant would be using. So to recap, here are all of the points for moisture or for watering. So the first would be to elevate and then to use slopes. This is These are a couple of tricks that you could do to make sure that there would be proper drainage on your, on your garden beds. Next is to make sure that you're using a thick layer of loose homogeneous medium. Because that simply means that the roots are constantly exposed to water. Top dressing, it reduces the rate of evaporation which means that water retention is increasing. But there are other benefits to this which I think outweigh the reduced evaporation rate. When designing your garden drainage, do that during the wettest time of year because this allows you to easily do your flood testing, your wet clump test and whatever you need to do. So during summer or during the warmest part of the year, this is where you do staging or positioning and locating usable areas. While during the wettest time of year, this is where you prepare the soil and wherever you are going to plant itself. So the first one is to find where and this is the how. So the Philippines has wet summers so keeping your shade cloth on doubles as a thin sponge in addition to filtering the light. You've probably seen one of those videos of nurseries where there's shade cloth on top and it is drooping down after the rain and doing a little tap on the shade cloth makes all of the water fall down so that's what i meant by them acting as a sponge aim for maximum drainage because it's so humid in the tropics of course this is within the realm of your budget so make the most of what you can do the next group of variables are something that i call the plant group so this includes the native habitat the growing habit growing period the medium or the soil mix that you're using their health and nutrition native habitat as mentioned is basically the areas where they are found naturally and this is important because this would give you an idea of what sort of conditions that they normally grow in and using the knowledge we have gained learning about the Koppen geiger system of climate classification you would be able to see the differences between their native habitat and your own location this helps us plan out and think of what sort of adjustments that you need to do in order to make your climate more suitable, more habitable for the plants that you want to use. Again, the Aeoniums are endemic to the Canary Islands, which has CSA or CSB, CSC. This means C is temperate, S means dry summer. So the Philippines has wet summers and it is tropical, which means that the temperatures are higher. The Philippines has AW, which means that it is dry during winter and wet during summer. This is going to be a problem because aeoniums are dormant during the hotter or warmer months and having too much water during the warmer months mean that they would be receiving more water than they need and you need to make sure that not a lot is retained by the soil mix. Growing habit refers to how the plant usually looks like or behaves. 
this is important because having a reference or knowing how it usually or how it should look like under ideal conditions would be great because if your plant does not look like the reference plant then you would know what is wrong so if you see it stretching or being very pale then you simply know that compared to the regular plant your plant is not receiving enough sunlight here's an example so both of these are county fair the left one is planted in the ground in a spot where it is only getting sunlight from morning till midday well this one on the right is in a pot and it was placed in a position where it was getting sunlight from midday all the way until afternoon basically the the red county fair is getting a lot more sunlight compared to this one which is still green it means that this is a lot more stressed and if i want it to be the usual green i would need to make sure that i filter the light on the red one but i kind of like the red one so if i wanted to turn this green into red i would have to remove it from this pot and place it somewhere where it could get a lot more sunlight growing medium this is your soil mix and you would have to decide the amount of organic versus inorganic this mainly affects water retention and drainage but it also dictates the nutrient and ph balance and susceptibility to pests and diseases too much organic means that there are more nutrients but it can also mean that it is a carrier for more microbes for more potential diseases so you'd have to make sure that your soil is relatively clean something you could do is to use the sun uv to burn or to solarize the soil maybe just lay it out on on a surface and let it bake under the sun that's one way to do it but yeah use whatever method that you know to clean your soil mix growing period so this refers to the period or time of year where the conditions are conducive to the growth of the plant again a good example would be aeoniums they are dormant during the warmer months and they tend to grow during the cooler months and when they are dormant they would be experiencing little to no growth this is why growing aeoniums can be very hard in the tropics because they tend to grow during the colder months and in the philippines it doesn't get that cold that much it is almost constantly warm and wet warm plus wet is not really good for aeoniums it prefers cool and wet so for health pests and diseases there are some some succulents are more prone to certain types of pests and diseases and this was covered in one of the past episodes of jello sanctuary's live streams and i would definitely recommend watching that i think if i find it i'll place a link down in the description but it's worth noting that a lot of pests and fungi are active during the warmer months and removing flower stalks can mitigate some of the insect infestations because they are attracted to the flowers or to the nectar as i've mentioned in the trailer it's not the water that kills them it is something else so this is pretty much it Sit having them sit in water means that there is a way or a conduit for microbes to get into the plant they travel via the water having the ability to completely drain the soil is important that way you reduce the risk or the chance of microbes going over into open cuts or into wounds nutrition they generally do not need much but an imbalance or deficiency can cause problems so i tend to use a rich soil base and just aggregate with pebbles and that's enough more than enough nutrients for my plants i do not top it up with additional fertilizers because you know it would just force them to grow quicker when they should not you only really need to use fertilizers if you see imbalances with nutrition or you know of course there are some advanced techniques where they're using some minerals some nutrients to encourage something let's say encourage growth or encourage flowering but for general use i think you're better off without using fertilizers because it also helps you save so more budget for plants so again as i mentioned regular garden soil or compost mix, mixed with pebbles or other inorganic material to loosen the medium can be rich enough to feed a lot of types of succulents they are not as fast growing as many other regular plants or native plants so it is more than enough so the bullet points for plant needs is start with plants that have a growing temperature range closer to your climate that would be the easiest otherwise you would have to do a lot of things just trying to mimic another climate basically what i'm saying is that if aeoniums are not easy in your area then give up on aeonium do not try spending too much time effort or energy trying to grow something that is very hard unless you have nothing else to do <laughs> it requires a lot of resources and you know resources that could have been spent 
elsewhere on something better. In the Philippines, wet summers would be a problem so filtering light might be needed to keep the plants within temperature range. This is mainly for plants that are dormant during the warmer months. And lastly, be practical. Going for regular garden soil or compost as base and just adding inorganic aggregates might be a lot cheaper than regularly trying to fertilize your garden. And having a diluted soil mix means that you would be needing less aggregates or inorganic materials too. Because I'm pretty sure that depending on where you live, these aggregates can cost a lot. I'm lucky that scoria is really cheap here in Victoria, but for other areas it might not be. So you have to be practical and just use whatever you can use. Since the Philippines has wet summers, you might consider using more of the plants that they consider as summer growers. That would be the easiest for you. When doing ground-based plantings, it's best to encourage thick clumps to grow as each plant can also act as mulch for each other. They can protect each other. Hot tip, start with a carpet of fast growers first and my go-to plant is Echeveria elegans. Fill an area and see how they go. So what would I do if I had to create a garden, a succulent garden in the Philippines or pretty much any tropical climate? So during the first year, I would focus on gathering plants and figuring out how to take care of them and figuring out the area that I'm working with in terms of light levels. So the main thing I would be doing is to focus on propagation and accumulation. Basically, just gather a lot of plants during this time. And that is in order to be able to do indicator plants, use the indicator plants method to make a map of usable spots in the garden. Having them in pots is okay. We are just interested in light levels. So place them all over your garden, everywhere that you intend to go, intend to plant, and see how these plants react to that area. Now for every spot that you pick, you would have to assess if you need to do any adjustments. You might have to add some light filters, whether they are temporary or permanent, it's up to you. So the end goal here is that by the end of the year, you would have a map of usable spots and you have noted any adjustments to the light levels that you might have to do. Year two, after creating your map, it is time to work on drainage. And using the techniques that I shared earlier, you would have to dig a slope on the ground. You have to either elevate or dig deeper or both and fill with a thick layer of loose soil. Top dressing, you have to use a thin layer. That way they do not retain too much. Just thick enough for it to act as, uh, just to cover the top soil to reduce the evaporation rate and to reduce the splashback and erosion of the soil. Very important is to start with easy plants first. And by easy, these are the plants whose growing conditions are closer to your native climate. This is very important because it gives you the confidence that allows you to be more ambitious, to be more brave and experiment with other plants. In the subsequent years, you could start expanding your range by incorporating or including progressively harder plants and adjusting the microclimate accordingly. Be more ambitious. So at this point, you could use various adjustments, whether these are utility or design aspects of your garden bed, just to adjust and make the spot more habitable. And by design, I mean clever use of shade by using different heights and features in your garden. And if needed, you could temporarily add a shade cloth during the hottest months of the year. This is something that I do myself. And of course, in a tropical climate, it's better to err on the side of drainage. Better have it too dry than too wet. It's easier to increase water retention or amount of water in your climate. So here are all of the variables again for your benefit. And basically, your job here is to find a mix or configuration of these elements to make it more habitable for plants to grow in your climate. So having learned about all of these, you would know which ones to mix and match and what sort of adjustments you need to do. And with all of these powers combined, this was supposed to be a joke slide at first, but if you think about it, it makes sense. So we have light, water, growing medium, plant needs, and heart. Without heart, everything will be for nothing. Because without heart, without love, without the passion, you would not be growing your plants in the most optimal way. You would not want them or you would not at least try to have them grow in the best way possible. So yeah, all of these are necessary. And that brings us to the end of the presentation. I hope you learned a lot from this. And another thing that I would like to know is what do you think of this format? Because I have a few presentations that I made a while back that I would probably be presenting in this lecture type format in a slideshow. And I would like to get your feedback on what you think about this format. I might try this again in some of my future videos. 
these are going to be standalone and separate from my vlog if you enjoyed this video please give me a like subscribe if you haven't yet make sure to hit the notification bell so you get notified whenever i put new stuff like this i definitely have more plans of this sort of presentations because a lot of the video ideas that i have is quite hard to execute right now especially with all of the rains our weather is not cooperating and i mostly have to stay indoors so being able to record inside this tiny room with some visual aids would be perfect i think if you need help navigating the video there are timestamps in the description and i think youtube now shows chapters in the video progress bar so that would at least allow you to skip to the parts that you want so with that said i'll see you in the next video bye Thanks for watching.